Welcome to Freighted Legacies. My name is Rabbi Chaim Beliak. This is a program of Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland, Beit Polska. Uh, this program this morning, uh, which I will introduce in a few moments, after I've had a chance to tell you a little bit about uh, our program of Freighted Legacies, uh, is part of a series that uh, brings us together with the uh, history of Polish Jews, um, the legacy of current life in uh, Poland um, with all of its complexities. Um, our audience are uh, Catholic Poles, Jewish Poles, secular Poles, um, a host of people who are interested in understanding the whole tangle of uh, the past and present, uh, both in its cultural and historical aspects. Uh, our topic today uh, will deal with uh, one of the most important historical events that took place July 4th, 1946, and continues to have both historical and uh, cultural um, echoes. Uh, we will dispense with a long introduction of our guests, uh, but I will introduce them in a moment after I share with you just a little bit of uh, the uh, the uh, uh, events that are taking place in uh, the community in uh, Poland, uh, just to report that the uh, congregations uh, celebrated uh, Starim uh, recently uh, in uh, Gdansk, uh, Warsaw, uh, and uh, Krakow, and uh, we had um, very good attendance. Um, there are in Poland the same manifestations of um, uh, expressions of concern about what is going on in the Middle East. There have been um, considerable um, uh, expressions by uh, uh, people at uh, Jagiellonian University regarding what is going on in the Middle East calls for divestment and so forth. Um, th that's uh, not our topic, but we uh, do want to uh, remark that those things are uh, going on. Uh, we uh, continue to be an active, progressive Jewish community and invite your uh, interest and participation in uh, looking at our website. Uh, today, I want to turn to the uh, topic of our uh, conversations, uh, because uh, we have an unusual uh, array of riches as we uh, begin uh, this program today. Uh, the um, uh, opportunity to hear uh, primarily from a scholar who is visiting uh, in the United States, uh, Joanna Torska Bakir, uh, who is uh, uh, sharing with us the English translation of a book that came out in November. We had originally hoped that we would hear from her um, in February and the uh, circumstances um, are leading to the fact that we're finally hearing from her in May. Um, the subject of this book um, uh, is captured in some aspect in the subtitle, A Social Portrait of the Celts of Pogrom. Um, in that title is uh, the very complex and uh, I would say um, artistically crafted work of a person who is an anthropologist, a literary scholar, and a religious scholar. Uh, these are some of the areas that um, uh, Dr. Torska Bakir works in. Uh, she is a full professor of ethnic and national uh, relations study at the Polish Academy of Sciences at the Institute of Slavic Studies. Um, she will be uh, sharing with us um, just a little bit. Unfortunately, this book is so wonderfully complex and, and crafted that um, she will not be able to go into all the detail. Um, I have read the book. Uh, I am in awe of the work and research she has done. Um, I can only say to those people who um, respect the work of anthropologists, historians, literary scholars, 
um, detectives. Um, this is one of the finest um, uh, pieces of uh, 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 thinking and um, scholarship that we have uh, seen in years. Uh, we are proud to have been among the uh, supporters of the English uh, translation. Uh, we are um, also uh, going to hear from uh, uh, Professor Jan Gross, um, who uh, teaches at Princeton uh, University. Uh, Dr. Gross uh, has written um, about uh, the subject of the Celts and Pogrom as well in his book, Fear. Um, he's written uh, widely about other topics of uh, history. Uh, I am uh, one of the avid followers of uh, his books. Um, I actually have not had the privilege to read them in the order he wrote them, but each one of them has been uh, what uh, I would call a um, bombshell in terms of uh, opening up the subject of Polish uh, uh, history, Jewish history, um, and thought. So we're very richly endowed. Um, I uh, now turn uh, the microphone over uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Torska Bakir, but first, I want to call to your attention that uh, you should go to the app um, below that says translation and choose the language that you will be, want to hear. Um, choose either English or Polish, and um, uh, that will allow you to be able to connect and hear it um, properly. At the conclusion of the presentation, uh, Dr. Gross will respond, and then there will be time for questions. The nature of things is that we will go a little longer than we normally do. Um, probably we'll, we'll conclude about 11.15, 11 11.20. 11 uh, I want to thank Marjana Szymanska, who is doing the simultaneous translation, and Dominika Zakraszewska, who's doing all the technical magic that is called Zoom. Uh, Dr. Torskabuk here. Uh, thank you and welcome. Witam. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good evening in Warsaw and Israel. It's a great honor that I can speak about this book and I'm really happy that it exists. I can show it to you. You can purchase this book. I am really grateful to all those who founded this effort, all uh, those who wrote reviews, all those who trusted this book even before reading it sometimes. And I'm very interested in your questions. Next Monday, I will have a lecture at the Museum of the Holocaust. And there I will show two recordings with the testimony of the survivors, the same ones that I'll show today. But first of all, I would like to talk about an undertaking of which this book is a part of. So I will show you the covers of three books. The third one is just uh, an idea, it will be published in the future. So we have the book Cursed that has been published in English. The other one has to do with the Krakow pogrom, and the English title can be Sharivari. And this book will be launched on June 26th of this book. It will be launched in the Pauline Museum and the next day at the Festival of Jewish Culture in Krakow. And the third book here, you can see it in yellow, it's uh, just being planned. It's still in heaven, you might say. So I'm planning to write this third book and this will close a certain project. So I want to sum up the topic of the largest pogroms in Poland after the war. And that was my intention when I started to research the Kielce pogrom. Uh, 
But let's start from the beginning, from the title. I'm just checking if everything is uh, fine with the language settings. So why cursed? Who has cursed whom? The title stems from a story that was circulating in Kielce right after the burial of the victims of the Kielce pogrom. So according to the story, during the eulogy or the funeral speech said when the 40 victims were being buried at the cemetery at Pakosha, According to those who listened, David Kahane cursed Kielce. Of course, this was a misunderstanding. I checked that and I was able to do that because the funeral speech of David Kahane, you can find the outlines in the Jewish History Institute in Warsaw. It is part of the materials of the Social Cultural Association of Jews. This is the first page of the speech. You can see it here. So in the speech, Rabbi Kahana mentions the words of the fifth book of Moses. And it has to do with the situation when you find the body of a killed person. So you should bury that body. And then those standing by the grave should say, Oh Lord, we are not uh, guilty for the death of this man. And David Kahane said, how many of those standing here today could repeat that sentence? And then he addressed the clergy of the Polish Catholic Church, and he asked about their attitude towards this event, if they feel like they haven't done anything wrong. So when I wrote this book, I asked myself this question. So I asked the primate of Poland, Archbishop Wojciech Polak, and I proposed that I can go to Gniezno, where his seat is, and I can share my conclusions that stem from my research that I've done over many years. Because I believe that only the Catholic Church is able to change anything definitely when it comes to the attitude of Poles towards the Kielce pogrom and to the issue of Shoah in Poland. So when I sent a reminder after three months, I did not get a reply at first. He said that maybe I don't have to come to Gniezno, but maybe I could talk to Bishop Markowski, who is a delegate of the Polish primate for Christian Jewish matters. Of course, I did that right away. I wrote to the secretary and I got a confirmation that my letter has been printed out and put on the desk of Bishop Markowski, who went skiing. And he was supposed to uh, contact me when he came back from his skiing trip, but he never got in touch. And, well, I'm quite embittered about that, although I didn't have much hope that such a conversation would happen. But nonetheless, I wanted to try, because we cannot reverse, take back the evil that has happened. 
but we can limit it in some way. How can we limit it so that it won't spread anymore? Because evil is not something that is motionless, that stays in one place. So it's about limiting evil. And we can do it by saying the truth. So that was my intention when I was writing this book and when I'm writing the next one. It's about telling the truth. It's a kind of metaphysical intention. And that's because when you say the truth, there are some things which you may call miraculous. After publishing this book, Cursed, I've been receiving many different letters. As it turns out, also from the descendants of uh, the victims of the Kielce pogrom. So one of these people, the son of a person who was convicted as a perpetrator of the pogrom, the son just could not believe it. So the first letter wasn't so nice because he found my book. And well, today it's just easier to get in touch with the author rather than spend money, buy the book and actually read the book. So I answered as honestly and as assertively as I could. I was encouraging him to read the text about his father. I didn't have much hope for a continuation of this conversation, but I got another letter in a completely different tone. I haven't received many such letters, but a couple did. And I think there is a process going on after the publication of this book. And this process is facing some obstacles. And that's because in the structure of Polish public debate, these obstacles do exist. And the conclusions uh, that can be drawn from my research simply contradict the expectations, the structure of this debate. And what kind of structure is it? Well, it's much easier to blame some foreign forces, to say that they just came here and they provoked the poor Poles who were so moved by this uh, allegation that a Polish child had been kidnapped and that's why they killed the Jews. That is easier than just to believe that it's possible that without any provocation, people will be killing Jews. That something like that is possible one year after the war, after such a war, after everything that happened to the Jews during that war. The structure of the Polish debate you can say is trying to protect those who are writing this debate, participating in it, mostly the elites. It doesn't want for the elites to have to take responsibility for this pogrom. In books that were written about the pogrom previously, there is a book published by the Polish Institute by National Remembrance. It has two volumes. And there were maps of Kielce, but it never showed the place where there was the Kielce Cathedral. And on that day, there was a mass in the cathedral because it was a, the anniversary of the death of General Sikorski. So even if some people were not allowed to enter the Planta Street region, then at the cathedral, there was a mass and uh, they could have said some words to this mob committing the pogrom to make them stop. But we don't know anything about such words. I'm almost sure that no one ever spoke them. That's why it's so important to address the spiritual elites when we try to ask for such behaviors. During one seminar at the Museum of Holocaust, I found out some information that is close to this rejection of the Polish elites to 
simply accept the situation. So in Germany, there keeps on arising this surprise that the Wehrmacht could commit any crimes. And the, the surprise appears cyclically. It's a cycle. So they, just people are surprised that the Wehrmacht could have participated in crimes, in shooting people. And we know that it happened. It's been proved. So it's just... Uh, something that happens, that uh, some events are do not match our imagination, do not match the symbolical structure of the public debate in Germany, that the army should be honorable. And in Poland, Elżbieta Janicka called this phenomena a cyclical surprise of the Polish intelligentsia who already from 1946, in the commentaries to the Kielce pogrom, was describing the circumstances of this pogrom, but then this knowledge is just very quickly repressed. And I have no illusion that also the discoveries that I've made in my book will also be repressed. For example, publications in Gazeta Wyborcza, in uh, the subsequent years after this book, Cursed, was published. Different people, sometimes very esteemed, Polish intelligentsia, lawyers, people who are known to fight for the rule of law in Poland. So they were repeating all the stories about the provocation, about the bad Russians who provoked the innocent Kielce residents. So this process that we're seeing is facing many obstacles. So it's not something that goes in one direction, that is clear, it's, it's very difficult. And as we confront it, we have to be aware that the price is very high, that we are fighting for something very important. It has to do with this curse after the pogrom, that will be hanging over the Kielce residents, over all the Poles, as long as the truth is not expressed. But now there is a very good message. In Kielce, in Krakow, also a pogrom took place earlier in August of 1945, and it's the first town in Poland to take responsibility for what happened several decades ago in that town. And that was not the first pogrom. There were around 20 of them before. So the outgoing mayor of Krakow, Jacek Machrowski, has uh, agreed to be the patron or that the city will be a patron of my book. So maybe one day it will happen in Kielce as well. So now there is a question. I ask myself this question. How to tell the truth if we don't have unambiguous evidence? Professor Gross wrote about it, Professor Scheinoch as well. So historians usually said that we don't have any definite evidence. And according to those who love conspiracies, lack of evidence is the best evidence. But what I wrote was actually very simple. I was trying to imitate the way that uh, crime uh, investigators work. I was just trying to find out who was there, who was there on site. So that's my method. I would take every last name that contained any personal data and I was checking it. It was simply researching each and every last name in the Polish Institute of National Remembrance. And I could also tell you a lot how such a research affects the human psyche. 
but at the same time it uh, gives a lot of satisfaction because well you find all the information but sometimes i had to file several hundred sometimes several thousands uh, requests for someone to search the archives to find out who was that person what they did before the war what they were doing during the war and after the war and the conclusions derived from this research were the most outstanding and extraordinary so contrary to what is thought about the circumstances of introducing communism in Poland, so in Kielce to a small extent, in Krakow a little bit bigger, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't communists uh, who were building or Jewish communists who were building communism, but it was the anti-communists who were cooperating with the communist authorities. So there were some structures that allowed the, not even the emancipation of the Jews, but emancipation away from the Jews. And it ended quite quickly because uh, communist Jews, even if they held any state positions below the central level, one year after the Krakow pogrom, as I proved in this new upcoming book, they were leaving Poland in a panic because they already understood the kind of agreement that was made with them. After the Kielce pogrom, a lot of Jews left Poland. It's estimated that it's about 200,000 Jews. And that was the end of a certain dream of Polish Jews that emancipation is possible in Poland of a kind that they would expect. The method that I am using has been used before. Ludwig Neimer, that's who I want to mention, Louis Bernstein, who was using this uh, method when he was trying to write the joint biography of the British uh, political elite. And he showed, just as I showed for Krakow and Kielce, that in the 18th century, political divides were very, uh, they weren't really fixed, that they were fluctuating, that uh, MPs would change their party affiliation and they were more interested in their own interest than the ideology of the party. So the ideolo ideology that they followed was basically a fiction, just like the communist ideology that uh, the members of the public security office of the civil militia and others who participated in Polish communism. So they were, what they all had in common was anti-Semitism. So it was really an international group that had anti-Semitism in common. So slowly they were getting rid of the Jews. I've been speaking for 20 something minutes and uh, the main point are the testimonies of the survivors of the pogrom. So now let me tell you about them. So besides this widespread research about specific people to find out who was there at the site of the pogrom, another key factor was, find, was the fact that I found in the Polish Institute of National Remembrance uh, I found the recordings that were done in 19, the 1990s in Israel by Piotr Miłosz and Mr. Weichert. So after the book was published, I contacted Piotr Weichert. And uh, in his collection, there are some real treasures. I would like to share some of them with you. But I found out about it when this book, Cursed, was already prepared. 
Even before watching these recordings, I learned about the existence of Nusha Borenstein. You're going to meet her soon and see her and her fiancé, Shmulek Nester. Exactly on the day of the Kielce pogrom, they went for their first walk as a engaged couple. Shmulek was already a victim of the Krakow pogrom, so he quickly understood what's happening. That's why he wanted to find a safe place as soon as possible. He wanted to hide in the flat of the rabbi at the Fosha Street. It was next to the headquarters of NKVD and the command post of the Red Army. But Nusha here was very adamant and she didn't want to hide. She wanted to go back to the rest. So the engaged couple got split and Nusha herself went back to Plant 7. And she will tell you about it. She was wounded during the pogrom, but uh, it wasn't severe, so she was able to take care of other wounded in the hospital. So in these recordings made by Miłosz and Weichert, there are more such materials. So this is the perspective of the witnesses, of those who suffered, who were endangered by the pogrom. So this gives me a different perspective. And when I listen to that, I simply cannot believe in any hypotheses about a provocation. Here you see from a close-up how the events were unfolding. And then if you supplement them by materials found in uh, research, because then the last names uh, are confirmed of those that the survivors are talking about, and then we'll see what happened to them later, what was the consequence of their attitudes in the pogrom of those who were trying to save people. And then we'll see that the story is much more interesting when we do away with the hypothesis of a provocation. So before we show the recordings, I'd like to tell you about the project that maybe will be will start one day if we're able to collect the funds. And I'm trying to talk Piotr Weichert into it. So that from the testimonies of the survivors to make a different kind of film, that there won't be any mention of a provocation, but will give the voice just to the survivors. And now we can rely on the research that I've done, and we are looking for the funds to prepare such a film. And uh, that's my inspiration, a film, Empire, that you can see on Netflix, a Chim's Empire, it's about chimpanzees, actually. But if I remember correctly, we share 98 of DNA with them. So the story that is told there, it's simply fantastic. It's a story about one family of chimpanzees. So one day they got separated and they started to live in two different parts of the forest. And then they forgot that they are a family and they started a war between them. So it's really done wonderfully because the chimpanzees are not an anonymous crowd, but you can identify them. You can recognize their, their faces. You, can, uh, you get accustomed to how they behave, what they are doing. You can see how hatred explodes and what its consequences are. So I would be so happy if uh, we could translate the ideas I described in the book into a movie so that they could uh, reach those who do not read books. So I will stop here. And now can we please show the shorter film recording with Ms. Nusha Borenstein. And then, then we'll give the floor to her fiancé, Shimon, and then she will end. I'm Nusha Borenstein. 
s manželmi nestali. Pravým je dynačkom v domu. Můj otec byl inženýrem, urodil jsem se v Lodži. Moje matka byla profesorem. Zrobila dva fakultety v Lipsku. Potom přijechala do Polsky s povrotem i pracovala v pár školách. Učila obcech jazyků francuskiego i byłam bardzo, bardzo przywiązana do Polski. Urodziłam się w Polsce, byłam w Polsce 20 lat, oprócz roku, który spędziłam w koncentracyjnym obozie. Nie wyjechałam z Polski, gdyby nie to, że nastawienie przeciw Żydom było, było właśnie takie, jak było. I pogrom w, pogrom w Kielcach zmusił mnie jeszcze do tego, że, żeby zamknąć ten, tą, ten, tą część, w moj, w moj, ten oddział w, moj, w moim życiu i żeby jechać dalej, żeby zapomnieć przeszłość, ale to nie jest takie łatwe, dlatego że od czasu do czasu się wspomina te lata, które się spędziło w ojczyźnie, która była ojczyzną, jednak ojczyzną, przez 20 lat i nieraz śnię, wspominam sobie polskie lasy, polskie miasta, wakacje, które spędzaliśmy w górach, w Krynicy, w Rochcie, w Jaremczu, w Zakopanym. Po pięciu latach getta i po roku obozu, obozu koncentracyjnego wróciliśmy do Polski, wróciliśmy do Łodzi. Byliśmy w, w ośrodku reproduktywnym dla młodzieży żydowskiej żeby postarać się przygotować się do pracy ciężkiej, która nas będzie tutaj czekała i żeby nauczyć młodzież, która z nami razem będzie do, jechać, jechać do Palestyny, trochę o y, Palestynie, znaczy o Eretz Israel, jak to się teraz nazywa. Po skończeniu kur, kursu instru, instruktorski, instruktorskiego Pojechaliśmy do Kielc, ja i mój mąż, żeby tam prowadzić zajęcie młodzieżą, która przyjechała z Rosji, która przyjechała, wróciła z Rosji i która się zorganizowała, żeby jechać do Palestyny. Tego dnia, krytycznego dnia, wyszliśmy na spacer. Zostawiłam mojego męża, znaczy mojego narzeczonego, wtedy już e, zostawiłam, zostawiłam go na ulicy. Wróciłam do kibucu i po drodze się słyszało te wszystkie e, przekleństwa, te wszystkie obraźliwe słowa. Ja nie miałam doświadczenia, ale wiedziałam tylko jedną rzecz, że chcę być razem z wszystkimi. I wróciłam do kibucu. Plac był olbrzymi, dlatego że to była szkoła tam koło, te, koło yy, kibucu. Prawda? Szkoła była. Rafał, szkoła była? Tak. I plac, pla, yy, plac był olbrzymi. Yy, po drodze się, słyszałam, że wszystkie fabryki zamknęli, że całe miasto poszło bić Żydów. I to słyszałam po drodze. I nie wiem, jak mi się udało przez ogromną masę ludzi przejść i oni mi zostawiali, zostawili przejście. Ja mówię, ja chcę tam wracać, a po co pani tam wraca? Ja chcę tam, ja chcę tam do, te, do, do tego domu wejść. No jak pani chce, to niech pani wejdzie. I się śpieli. Nie powiedziałam, że tam mieszkam. Weszłam do środka. Weszłam na piętro. Drzwi były jeszcze otwarte, ale było pełno ludzi na ulicy, znaczy na, na placu. Wszyscy byli uzbrojeni w, nawet 
że nawet um, kawały um, wyrywali z, z płotów, wy, wy, wyrywali kawały um, um, ta, sztachety ze spła, z, po, z płotów, kto nie miał czego innego. Wszystko było uzbio, uz, uzbrojone, kobiety i mężczyźni, tak? Każdy coś miał w ręce. Ja tam poszłam do środka, nic mnie nie interesowało i weszłam na górę i się pytałam, co, co słychać, co wy tego. I wszyscy się bali i potem po, po chwili zaczęły, zaczęły padać kamienie. Zaczę, rzucali mi kamienie i było tam okropne krzyki na, 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 na dole było. Nie wiem, co się tam działo w drugiej stronie, gdzie byli chłopcy, ale myśmy dziewczęta, by, by, byliśmy tam w środku i jeden z naszych chłopców był, y, siedział na podłodze i miał y, rewolwer. I on mówi, ja pan będę was bronić. I były takie ciężkie drzwi i myśmy te drzwi zamknęli, y, zamknęły i myśmy y, jedną prycie, były tam prycie, jedną prycie tam na to postawili, y, postawiły i potem y, on siedział naprzeciwko drzwi w pewnej chwili Yy, słyszeliśmy, że, że, że wołają, żeby otworzyć drzwi. No to myśmy nie chciały, myśmy się bały, zaczęły płakać. Po chwili yy, zaczęło się strzelanie. Strzelili w yy, yy, zamek, żeby otworzyć te drzwi, żeby otworzyć te drzwi. A ten, ten człowiek, który jest, znaczy ten, jeden, jeden z chłopców, on był dorosły, on był w, w, rosyjskiej, w, w rosyjskiej armii, on y, po wojnie wrócił, wrócił z powrotem do Kielc i oni go zabili, oni go zamordowali, oni mu strzelili w, w głowę. To było coś okropnego, widzisz, coś takiego. I potem zaczęli nas wyganiać przez y, y, klatkę schodową na dół. Zejdźcie i zejdźcie i wyjdźcie i, i, i wynoście się stąd. I w pewnej chwili odwróciłam się i widziałam, że bior, biorą tą balkę i że ją rzucają przez, przez e, e, balkon na dół. I potem słyszałam, że ją złapali na bagnety. I jeszcze jedna była, że przyjechała piękna dziewczyna, wysoka, blondynka. Przyjechała z Rosji z tym e, chłopcem, z tym, z tym panem, który, którego pan już tutaj widział, że jest niewidomy. Tak? To była jego przyjaciółka. Ona śpiewała i on gra, e, w, grał na gitarze. Było wesoło w kibucu przedtem. I myśmy się bardzo, bardzo dobrze trzymali razem. I było nam bardzo dobrze razem. I zamordowali tą fanię też. Znaczy ją też rzucili z piętra i słyszałam potem, że, 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 że te dwie dziewczynki złapali na bagnety i ją zakuli na, na śmierć. Ja nie byłam na pogrzebie, dlatego że ja byłam w szpitalu, a potem nas zabrali, zabrali do łodzi ze szpitalu. Ale zeszliśmy na dół, po, dro po drodze były, by stali, y, y, myślały, ja myślałam, że oni przeszli nas bronić ocalić nas, dlatego że już widziałyśmy, że, że tutaj się dzieje coś mi niedobrego. To po drodze oni tak sobie, kogo trafili, to, to, to dali po głowie, rozumie pan? Tośmy zeszły na dół i stało, stało tam z, około drzwi, było dwóch żołnierzy, ale nie, nie, to też takich milicjantów z karabinami i też walili karabinami po głowie. Ja sobie myślę, jak ja dostanę po głowie, to ja leżę. Ja się nie rusza. I tak zrobiła. To sam po głowie. <głos> nie wstałam więcej, żeby się bronić albo coś takiego, ale jeszcze zdążyłam mu powiedzieć. To przecież wy mieli, przy, przy, przyszliście tutaj, żeby nas bronić, żeby nas ocalić. To sam po głowie. Sam po głowie. I się położyłam i leżałam. Yy, straszne były wrzaski, straszne były... Yy, Przekleństwa i straszne były, yy, straszny ruch był naokoło. Ja się u, u, udawałam się, że, że, że jestem, udawałam, że, że jestem nieprzytomna, że, że, że nie żyję. Że tego tylko od czasu do czasu patrzyłam, co się dzieje. Widziałam, że 
tutaj jedna i druga starała się wstać i uciekać, to to dostała jeszcze raz, jeszcze raz, jeszcze raz po głowie, jeszcze raz po plecach. Potem pod, pod wieczór się zrobiło cicho. Nie wiem, kto tam zrobił porządek. Wiem tylko jedną rzecz, że przyjechali, jak, przy, przyjechały ambulansy i zabrali nas do szpitala. I potem zaczęli się nami opiekować. Tak? A pierwsza rzecz, którą zrobili, ogoliny nam głowę. Moja przyjaciółka, Hindzia, że tutaj siedzi, miała długi, długi warkocz, blond, blondynka, piękne włosy, które ocaliła przez cały czas, że była w, w Rosji. I ostrzelili jej głowę, ogolili jej głowę zupełnie, to mnie też. Także warunki w szpitalu też nie były takie bardzo przyjacielskie. Ja, to się czuło, to się czuło w powietrzu, że, że się słyszało, że szkoda, że was nie zabili, szkoda, że, 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 że wy jeszcze żyjecie, szkoda, że wszystkich nie zabili. Tam były, że to były yy, zakonnice nie? w szpitalu, zakonnice tak mówiły. To w ogóle nie jest chrześcijańskie, żeby tak powiedzieć, że szkoda, że ludzie nie, nie zostali Duża przy życiu. Tak, tak? nie powiedziała szkoda, że... Nawet y, pan się nie musi mną, mną opiekować, dlatego że mnie nic nie jest. Ja dostałam tylko po głowie, mnie, mnie boli, ale to mi przejdzie. Ja tylko trochę jedyny potrzebuję. Ja wam jeszcze pomogę, żeby się opiek jak się opiekować rannymi. I zaczęłam się opiekować rannymi tam wszystkimi, którzy, których znałam karmić ich, siedziałam tam, dopóki nie, nie przyszli, nie zabrali nas do Łodzi, do, do kibucu z powrotem. I to jest powiedzmy koniec wszystkiego. Ja myślę, że to było spontaniczne, ale to na pewno była jakaś grupa y, bardzo y, y, krańcowa, tak? antysemityów, którzy chcieli doprowadzić do takiego stanu i prawdopodobnie, że to spacerowało po całej Polsce, że to bali, byli ludzie, którzy, którzy organizowali tu i organizowali tam przez cały czas pogromu, znaczy tego samego dnia czy dzień przedtem mordowali ludzie w, ludzi w, w pociągach. O tym wy wiecie, tak? Także to było widocznie zorganizowane, ale kto to zorganizował, ja nie wiem, ale ja myślę, że to było, że to nie była rosyjska yy, robota. Rosjanie, Rosjanie nie, lubili, nie lubili się mieszać. Rozumie pan? Oni może nie pomagali, tak? I nie, 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 nie lubili się mieszać, a nie, nie wyobrażam sobie, że, że oni tam yy, yy, ten, cały, ten cały interes... Yy, zorganizowali albo... Ja mówię, że to jest zupełnie polskie. Strzelania nie było dużo strzelania. Ja nie słyszałem dużo strzelania. Ale w takich warunkach nie mogę powiedzieć dokładnie, ile razy, ile, ile razy strzelali, tak? Ale mogę powiedzieć, że ludzi było tak jak maku. Tak jak maku. I wiem dokładnie i mogę przysięgać, tak, że zamknęli fabryki i wszyscy poszli mordować Żydy. I mówili to po drodze i ja to słyszałam. Ale kto, ktoś, kto to wziął do serca? Myślałam, że mówią, przeklinają, że, że, że straszą, że ja wiem co. Żydzi do Palestyny, Żydzi do Palestyny. Ta historia z... E, e, z dziećmi, dziećmi chrześcijańskimi, że gdzie się zabija na mace, zabija na mace to przecież od średniowiecza, średniowiecza już idzie. No to, 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 to kogo można obwiniać? Kogo można obwiniać? Czy pan może wiedzieć dokładnie, kto, to, kto tą kaczkę puścił? Nie może pan wiedzieć. On nie, nie, nie wyobrażam sobie, żeby Rosjanie byli winni. Rosjanie mnie wyzwolili z obozu koncentracyjnego. Ja z moją koleżanką, która się nazywa Niusia, a teraz jest moją żoną, żeby była zdrowa, postanowiliśmy pewnego 
dnia lipcowego, pięk, piękny poranek był, lipcowy, wyjść na spacer. To był pierwszym razem, że wyszliśmy prawie na spacer z tego kibucu. Po drodze zaczęliśmy słuchać krzyki, opowiadania, przeważnie Polki. Jedna opowiadała, że spotkali, że znaleźli w piwnicy dziesięć, dziesięcioro dzieci. Druga skoczyła. To było, że znaleźli dwanaście dzieci zabitych. Więc wyszliśmy na, na, na ulicy i zaczęliśmy, widzieliśmy od razu, co tu się dzieje. Ja zrozumiałem, że tu jest bardzo niebezpieczna rzecz i zaczęliśmy się oddalać od Planteszewa. Szliśmy różnymi drogami, ulicami właściwie, żeby, żeby nie być na, na, na głównej ulicy. I tak doszliśmy do głównej ulicy, gdzie była UB i gdzie Rosja. Ros, Rosjanie byli. Bramy, brama tam była, ciężka brama w UB i tam, gdzie Rosjanie byli. Ciężka brama i ta brama była tym razem zamknięta. Ja wiem, że na tej ulicy mieszkał lekarz nasz z kibucu i od czasu do czasu szliśmy tam, to zawsze ta brama była otwarta. A w tym dniu była zamknięta brama na dziesięć spustów. I ja tam, i ja do mojej koleżanki, do Niusi powiedziałem, wiesz co, może się ukryjemy gdzieś tutaj, tutaj będzie bezpiecznie, tutaj, bo tutaj Rosjanie są, tu jest UB, tu na pewno będzie bezpiecznie. Ja tak patrzę się i tam jest jeszcze jedna brama maleńka, ma, słaba, malutka brama taka i tam od czasu do czasu ta brama się otwiera i wchodzi jakiś Żyd. I potem jeszcze raz ta brama się otwiera i znowu tam wchodzi Żyd. A ja mówię do mojej, do mojej koleżanki, Jusia, chodź, wejdziemy tutaj też. Jak ja do niej powiedziałam, to ona mnie powiedziała, to ja wracam, wróć ty też. Co będzie z wszystkimi, to będzie ze mną też. I nim ja się zorientowałem, zorientowałem co, tu, co, nie, co tu ma być. Jusia już nie była, ona wróciła. I could give you many comments about these recordings. I could show you more of them, but I'll just say one sentence. It's a very ironic moment to listen today to this when Jews hear that they should go back to Poland. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Joanna, um, um, for your uh, very moving report. Um, I read the book, but I, I did not see this a uh, verbal film, um, um, which is particularly um, sh um, shocking. Um, I want to now uh, turn to uh, Dr. Gross um, uh, for his reaction, which will also be delivered uh, in uh, Polish. And um, I'm sure that people are uh, sharpening their pencils. Uh, and they can ask questions on the Q&A form or on the um, the um, chat. Uh, Dr. Gross? Thank you very much. It's quite an extraordinary history. A lot of the things that I heard are quite surprising to me, I might say. But they are also convincing. Starting from the very beginning. So from this declaration that Professor Tokarska-Bakir has dedicated many years to researching this topic, and she believes that the right way to somehow 
disarm this issue to neutralize it to try to find a way to persuade the public everyone everyone in the society that she said that the right way is to talk to those from the church and i think well this is a, says something about the issue of anti-semitism in poland and especially anti-Semitism in the context of uh, various events which are caused by anti-Semitism. So there was a series of pogroms right after the war in different places in Poland. But also the behavior of uh, the widespread Polish society during the occupation towards the Jews and the persecutions that were inflicted on the Jews by their neighbors. So to name all these things, to confront the society with them, I believe that uh, the right way is to somehow motivate an intervention from the church. And that's because, in my opinion, the church is, in a very deep sense, responsible for what happened. First of all, because of the anti-Semitic message before the war, And during the war, the priests or the church as an institution has not reacted, has not opposed the behavior of the widely understood Polish society. They did not react to the fact that Jews were being persecuted, the ones who could, ha who could have survived. But for the first time, I heard something like that from Professor Tukarska Bakir, and we know each other very well. And we spoke several times after she wrote this great book. And so I have a question, a question to Joanna, so how did you imagine a conversation with the primates of Poland? What did you want to tell him? And what did you imagine that he would reply? That's the first question. What emerges from your presentation is quite surprising to me. And namely the conviction that uh, there is a problem that needs to be solved, that it's still impacting the societal imagination. And the thing to tell the truth about what happened in Kielce that uh, has to go through disarming, rejecting the hypothesis about a provocation. And many things happened. There was an investigation by the Polish Institute of National Remembrance. And their conclusion also was that this option of a provocation doesn't make sense, that there is no proof of that. So why do you believe that right now this is the basic matter that uh, has to be become wi wi widely known, that we have to publicize this so as to solve this problem? 
And one last reflection. What's actually important in all of this is this madness of the accusation of a ritual murder, of blood libel. And this was so deeply rooted, it was just viewed as something obvious in white societal circles. And you, Joanna, know about this very well. You've conducted large ethnographic studies even before you wrote the books. So what's the cure, the medicine, for this fact that we simply cannot understand what was the essence of the anti-Jewish violence in Kielce? This is our reference point. So I guess the cure should not be disavowing the option of a provocation because there are no arguments to uphold that hypothesis. So maybe we should somehow intervene very strongly about the belief in the blood libel. And here maybe if you would talk to representatives of the church hierarchy, then maybe here you should mention something that happened in Kielce, the statement of Bishop Kubina. And then two months later, if I remember correctly, in September, there was a letter of the episcopate and they are criticizing Bishop Kubina, someone who just behaved badly. So it's just a bunch of reflection. It's all very interesting and very surprising to me. I thought that in your opinion, the matter that still needs to be solved in order to simply disavow the absurdity of the thesis about the provocation, that this is what should be done. So I will just briefly answer. So how did I imagine the conversation with the primates of the Catholic Church? Because uh, he is considered to be a decent person. I wouldn't speak like that with any previous representatives like Primate Glemp or others who are not seen or were not seen as decent persons. But Archbishop Wojciech Polak was seen as someone who is not cynical. So I thought that someone who is not cynical is the right uh, kind of person to have a conversation with. It's someone who believes in a certain spiritual reality, that there is something like a conscience. It's not just about God, but also about the conscience. Yes, and a clergyman should be aware of these kind of things. <laughs> Let's be honest. So I imagine that I would write this, uh, read the passage of the funeral speech of Rabbi Kahane, who was asking the Polish Catholic clergy, where are you? And I'm sure he doesn't know that there was such a question to the Polish church. So now after so many years, uh, this uh, woman comes to him and now she's saying, please answer this question. That's how I imagined that meeting. But the Polish clergyman is not a hero, it seems. So I described their attitude. First, uh, he was trying to send me to someone else. And then I was ignored, even though I got a confirmation that the bishop got my letter. So this is the reality that 
there is still cynicism and a pragmatic approach. Let's not touch this issue. The situation is already bad. We don't need uh, another problem. We don't want to deal with some past murders. And let me move to your third question about the blood libel. It's a very important topic, but I don't have good news. There was someone who was my ally in the fight against the blood libel belief, priest Lemański, Wojciech Lemański. So when my book Legends about blood in 2008 was being published, that priest had the courage to say that the blood libel was part of this uh, pious tradition of the Polish church. But now he withdrew from that opinion. Priest Lemański was persecuted by the church. He was suspended. He was threatened that he would be kicked out of the clergy. And he was always reacting to anti-Semitism. So here he changed his opinion to one that I don't like so much. But I think he accepted this line of argument of the church, that the church is not responsible for the blood libel. And this is madness, because since uh, the 12th century, from William of Norwich, this was an official story of the church. And I proved in my book that in 1946, Bishop Radonski, under communist rule, he repeated some of these legends, even at a time when uh, church publications were did not fall under communist censorship. So this was an official statement of the church that uh, Jewish murdering of innocent Christians is actually true. And today, when there is a, a rise in anti-Semitism, also in the United States, this is relevant. But I'll tell you what I found out in Princeton. When I got a scholarship of the European Commission and I went to the Institute of Advanced Studies, my director, Didier Francais, a French anthropologist, he criticized me for the fact that I am criticizing the peasants from Sandomierz, a Polish small village, who believe in a blood libel. He said, I am criticizing my information sources. Because he said, how do you know what happened in this village of Sandomierz several hundred years ago? Who knows what happened in the past? So imagine when in the small village of Sandomierz you hear about blood libel and then you go to Princeton and a French anthropologist who is the head of the social studies school tells you that it might have happened. Simply this lack of knowledge why blood libel is actually libel and not like vengeance about the Jews, this knowledge is just not available to some renowned Anthropolo anthropological researchers, scholars. So in my thinking, I'm going back to some traditional authorities because I think that without them, like the Polish Catholic Church, the people who tell you that, well, there must be a grain of truth in every legend, that such people will keep on talking that there must be a grain of truth in such legends, even if they have a PhD, like this French gentleman. He doesn't understand that we speak about a libel because it's never been proven that any Jews have ever done that for religious reasons. But he just uh, put forward this uh, thesis that, uh, well, Jews also could kill a child, but this is not blood libel. So we are just uh, facing some demons of the dark. It's this uh, 
peasants or popular ideology who just doesn't understand what is modern science, that there is this threshold of proof that you need to have some evidence that this is important. And here I'll answer the other question about the provocation. It's not just Polish peasants who are backwards, but also lawyers and so on. They would also repeat ideas about the provocation, even though Gazeta Wyborcza, the most widely read newspaper that's read by the intelligentsia, and Gazeta Wyborcza, this uh, newspaper was uh, discussing my book, but uh, Jacek Dibois, three years later, was talking about the provocation. Irena Grudzińska, on my request, wrote to this lawyer, and she told him that this has been a research, and uh, there was no provocation by the NKVD, that this is foolishness. And uh, this lawyer said he's not a historian, he apologizes, but he did not say that publicly. So this year, in the Gazeta Wyborcza newslet, uh, newspaper, there also another statement that there was a provocation in Kielce appeared. It was written by uh, someone who edits the history part of the newspaper, and I asked them to take that back, and they said, okay, we don't know where this came from, so we won't publish that again, but there was no explanation that, look, here is a book that dispels that idea. So it's simply a fight with some dreams, with the imagination, and people will not stop dreaming. Yeah, it's a madhouse, basically. That's why I went back to this idea to ask traditional authorities. I hope there will be a time when the Polish church will take this upon itself, because today it's so weak that maybe it will want to improve its standing. And this is the easiest thing, just admit to your guilt. And I'm sure there are thousands of questions that people want to ask you, so I will leave the space to others. Yeah, so now it's time for questions. Will Dominika moderate the questions? Yeah, so Professor Tukarska will stay on the she will speak in Polish, but uh, she can listen in English. Okay, so. We have a few questions in Q&A and uh, in the chat. Uh, one of the questions we have from Mane Becker. Uh, hi, Joanna, this is Mane Becker. I just read some detailed information regarding how my cousin Belka Gertner from Ostrowiec was murdered. Nusia reported that Belka was uh, bayoneted. Does this imply that she was murdered by a military unit present there? What kind of military unit? As to Belka Gertner, also in the testimony of Nusia Borenstein, there is a statement about the bayonets. There were no witnesses, so we, I was not able to establish whether Belka was the one who was thrown out of the balcony or whether this was another person that uh, hid in a cellar and then she was beaten to death by a soldier. Gertner 
and Belka Gertner, along with uh, Rahel Kazander, they came to plant a street from the village Busko. It's a health resort. They were supposed to kind of uh, get better physically after what they went through during the war. At first, one of the historians was not aware that they came back to plant a street because someone called them on the phone and told them they shouldn't come back. But uh, actually, it got an opposite reaction because they decided to join the rest. Their bodies at first were not recognized by Yehiel Albert, the head of the kibbutz at Plant 7th Street, because he thought they would not be there. We know this from his testimony after the pogrom and those made in Yad Vashem in a conversation made by Idak Fik. So according to the second version, Belka was hiding in this uh, toilet that was somewhere in the yard and she was killed by soldiers. And what kind of soldiers were there? There were two military units at the Planta Street. It was the internal security corps, so the army of uh, internal security, so-called KBW, and the other ones were the ones from the second division of the Polish army. It was a communist army, but as the whole army and the whole civil militia, they were not well trained, so they didn't know if they are supposed to murder the Jews or if they're supposed to defend them. And that's a paradox of the Polish reality in 1945 and 46. So imagine a country where there is uh, almost no support for the communists, and suddenly there is a mandatory recruitment to the militia, the civil militia, or to the army. So the civil militia were, was more convenient. You had to sign an agreement for a shorter period. It was easier to get out of it. So it's a situation when you're hiring people who are your enemies. So trying to control such a group is basically impossible. These were people without any training. As I was able to prove through this method of uh, detailed research of their biographies, quite often they would kill Jews during the war. He were, they were in partisan units that were killing Jews, and often they joined the civil militia so that their atrocities would not come out. So the motivation is obvious. This was a group that could not be controlled, and it would not <clears throat> do, it would not do what we wanted them to do. So on uh, July 4th, uh, some reinforcements were sent from uh, Warsaw, from Gura Kalvaria, and then there was the Soviet army. Unfortunately, we have to say that the Russians actually guaranteed the end of this massacre of the Kielce pogrom. And if we take into account the attitudes in Poland towards Russians, and the Russians in this situation actually acted decently, although in the Krakow pogrom it wasn't like that because there they were actually beating the Jews, but this shows why this uh, option of a provocation is so attractive to Poles. Are there any more questions? There are more questions, and uh, I I must intervene. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that there is a very complex question that would require um, um, a full seminar. Um, uh, it's in chat. I want to read the questions um, and... Uh, acknowledge that they are uh, questions that we will deal with in future seminars. Um, but first, I want to thank um, our uh, 
speaker uh, and uh, teacher uh, to whom we are uh, in great debt, uh, Joanna uh, Torstava Kier, uh, for uh, opening up this um, important topic for us. I must uh, say, as a person who was the producer on a film uh, that deals with uh, the issue of um, how people are reacting in the city of Kelsa, uh, I was a producer on the film Bogdan's Journey. Um, your idea that somehow we would let just the uh, survivors speak and to, to put a film together like that, I, I thought when you voiced it was problematic, but when I had to listen and read just what was said, um, I be began to understand the power of, um, because I've heard so many of the um, uh, descriptions and re uh, read, heard so many of the, the testimonies. I was not aware of, um, uh, had not seen Nusha's uh, um, um, uh, testimony and had not seen her husband's testimony. I had read them in the book, but I to see them is very different, very powerful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Torskova here. I also want to thank um, Dr. Uh, Gross uh, for um, uh, participating with us. Uh, uh, this has been a very important um, uh, session for us, I think, especially in the context of what we are experiencing now uh, in America. We cannot help but um, um, listen to your words and think about these issues. Um, with a, a second set of ears and with a second set of eyes as we watch what's happening on campuses and um, think about uh, manifestos and uh, uh, so forth. Um, so um, uh, I would also um, now to return to the questions. Um, I will say that uh, we have plans for one of the people who's also studied the question of blood libel uh, Magda uh, Tetter, uh, who teaches at uh, Fordham, uh, is going to speak about her book, uh, Blood Libel, um, in the future. We've just got to agree on a, a date. Um, and uh, so one of the questions is from um, a rabbinic colleague of mine. I'm going to read the question just so we note it. Uh, what are the estimates of how many were killed and wounded? Um, th that's well established in the book. Uh, uh, when were interviews recorded and is the couple still together? Yes, they, they were together. I don't think they are alive anymore. Um, uh, what are the implications for our time now? That's the big question here in America and Europe. The, the, those are big questions. Also concerned about Catholic churches change. Uh, and here I think we have a debate about there is a, if there is a change uh, as a result of John Paul II um, um, and his uh, success, the two successors um, and backlashes in the church. Uh, quite an interesting series of things to debate. And uh, I also want to note uh, the um, uh, uh, qu question by uh, David uh, Cater, one of our board members, uh, also asking about the issue of uh, the influence of um, the Polish Pope. Um, and um, um, there's a very long question here. Um, uh, um, and um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I see, I see um, that the, 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 this is a very complex question. Um, um, uh, so uh, I will just uh, say that uh, people are, are welcome to read this question. Uh, it, it asks the question about um, um, the issue of the provocation. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Jonah uh, Buchstein uh, and his question. Uh, it's not so much a question, but just uh, a repetition of what we feel at the conclusion of this very interesting seminar 
uh, which is thanks and thanks to Yona for the, uh, his question. Um, as usual with the very good uh, seminars, it demands one that people go read the book um, and it leads us back to the fact that um, we have intention, uh, Yona, to, to support and be involved with the second book and the third book. Uh, please keep us informed. We uh, uh, invite you back already for a report. Um, um, and don't wait to, um, for the translation. Maybe we can get a head start on a report on the book on, uh, the, the second book is on Krakow, and the third book is on um, the city of... About the pogrom in Rzeszów. In Rzeszów, right, Rzeszów. So um, please, uh, we should um, uh, maybe hear about that uh, 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 b before they get translated into uh, English. Um, I want to note uh, that normally we have two people uh, who do uh, the uh, uh, translation. Uh, today we relied on the very good translations of Marjana Szymanska. Um, and she did a wonderful job of translating uh, from Polish to English. Normally she's translating uh, from uh, English to Polish. Uh, and we thank her for her uh, very uh, good uh, translation. Um, we will be uh, convening um, in June. Uh, we're still working on the exact date. Uh, the conversation uh, that we're planning is actually a conversation that will deal with the question of the date 1968 um, and the issue of uh, the um, invitation to leave Poland that was given uh, to Jews and the question of who will speak and, and how it will be structured. Uh, we'll be informing people and um, we ask you to get on our mailing list and to uh, support our work uh, financially. Uh, that's very important. Um, and again, thank you to Dr. Gross, to Dr. Uh, Joanna Toska Bakir. A special thank you to Dominika. Uh, stay uh, hydrated there in India. Um, and uh, we wish everyone a good day. Um, uh, warmest regards to everyone. Take care.